missiles. You used to have the missile and the silo side by side, just like in the Titans we were just talking about. Okay, and that made it an easy target. One bomb, you take out the missile and the crew, and you have nothing. All right. So what they did was with Minuteman is an improvement. Minuteman, they were able to go ahead and use solid fuel, which requires relatively no maintenance, and they were able to disperse it. So as an example, you're at Delta One right here. Okay. When we were fully operational, we covered 13,500 square miles of Western South Dakota. So they had three squadrons too, like North Dakota did. That's a standard configuration. Okay. Uh, F.E. Warren uh, was unique and had four squadrons. Okay. But they only have three operational. So the three squadrons, the comp what they comprise is there's five launch control centers. And within that squadron, they're all interconnected together by underground cable. Okay, they can, so that each launch control center can monitor in case another launch control center fails, goes offline, or whatever. But the squadrons are independent of each other. Okay? Now, communication is very important. You know, look out there, there's a beam of those red handles, it's like a well or something, manhole cover. That's what we call the hardened HF antenna. It's in a retracted position right now. If it wants to come out of the ground, the crew actually can have So that, so that's what the Boeing antenna is over at the site right down the road. Is it that communicates with that that security antenna over on the silo over here? No, no. that is strictly a security antenna to itself. The one over on the missile site? Right. That's just a, that's just a transmit and receive, and it's just strictly for security only. Only for security purposes. Security. The Boeing. Right. Okay. Yeah, the Boeing emphasis system, improvement in man physical. I've been trying to get some clarity on that, oh, yeah. so... We'll, we'll talk about it. Um, this antenna here is a, we call a hardened UHF, not HF, but UHF. There's a history behind this. Back in the early days of Strategic Air Command, that was the major command that controlled all the bomber, nuclear bombers and missiles, which I was under for most of my career, um, they had command posts at Offutt Air Force Base. you do command and control. Okay. So being the Air Force, we said, okay, well, let's put it in an airplane. So from 1967 to 1992, we used to fly an aircraft around 24 hours a day called Looking Glass. Okay. It's kind of neat because it's flying by Mount Rushmore. Okay. In that aircraft, we have what we call a battle set. And there was always a general on board. So in case there was a surprise attack, Crew 
with proper authority from the president, again, we then go ahead and initiate a launch. Because the airplane's flying at 35,000 feet, line of sight's pretty good, all right? So then, that signal would go out, and the missile that's the launch capable now would attack, receive that signal, if, it, if it's not on a, if it's not picking up anything from the launch control signal, launch, that was a bad one. Okay. Used to have two different types of aircraft. We had a Tacomo plane, which was belongs to the Navy, to talk to the ballistic missile submarines, all right? Today, uh, because of technology improvements and budget constraints, we still we have an aircraft, but it's not flying 24/7 anymore. But it's only called five-minute ready alert at off. Okay, in five, less than five minutes, the crew can be on board and it can be in the air. Right? And we're doing it jointly with the Navy. So instead of having two separate airplanes, we have one plane now where there's Air Force crew and Navy crew in that same aircraft. And instead of calling it, you know, Tacomo or Looking Glass, now it's called Mercury. So on E6. Any questions before we go downstairs? Hmm. A little different than the North Dakota site. Yeah. Yeah, they also had the Audubon system in North Dakota, which was another redundant way for them to do it by air. Yeah, we had Audubon here also. Oh, you did? Yeah, all, all side pieces had Audubon. Let's go inside. It's a little cool. Here we are uh, refurbishing this area in the launch control center. Basically what this area houses is the kitchen, the, the break area, bedrooms, because the missile crews come out and get stuck for, for the security forces that are out here, they're out here for three days at a time. They need places to stay and so the entire crew of the people comes out here for about three days. Okay. There you go. Huh, a little different elevator too. Yeah, it's not a freight elevator like the ones that mine up. We all coming on board. Yes. All right. That's why we limited yeah, to six. We <laughs> We're gonna be cozy. All right. We're gonna all be real friendly for a minute. <laughs> okay. okay. Now this thing is small oh. fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, because of the age of the elevator, and they had to upgrade all the electronics and everything. The old, the old electronics were great, now it's all computerized and everything. And so it's a, little, a lot more finicky, not like the old days. So when we get to the bottom, before we do anything to the gates, we have to wait. I have to listen to hear some switches and clicks up there. That would be good. Yeah, otherwise we're stuck. We'll have to climb up the top. Yeah, exactly. You notice it's a little cooler down yeah, here. Like it. This is just normal temperature. Okay, now we gotta wait. Okay, now we can, if you wanna raise that handle straight up. There you go, and the next one. And as you step out, you can look up and see how far down we are. We're 30 feet. That's the reason I tell you about the Delta 9. Going on a ladder because if you slip and fall, that's how far you're going to fall. <laughs> Each launch control center depth is different. What happens is, depending on the water table, um, what they run into, there's a minimum depth which is 30 feet, and then there's a maximum depth too, like you get our Kilo 1 launch control center. Uh, that was what we call our alternate command post. In case the base got destroyed, we still had to continue with operations. So Kilo 1 is actually 80 feet down in the ground. Okay, so it's a longer elevator ride. Um, this is the launch control center. We're going to go inside here in just a little bit. Uh, piggybacking on what you're talking about at Mina, okay, and at F.E. Warren. That was my last assignment. The modifications were you came down in a larger elevator. Okay, it was a freight elevator. And when it came down, there was a big blast door here, okay, and you open that blast door. That blast door, I think, weighed about uh, 10 tons. Okay, you open that up. When you get through that tunnel junction, this way was the launch control center. This way was what we call the support building because they buried it in the ground. 
Our system, because it was the number two that came online, they just put that equipment on the upstairs. We walked by it as we were coming down. Okay. Uh, the newer system, uh, again, it's more hardened because everything is below ground. From a maintenance standpoint, it's a pain in the butt because then you have to get all the way down here and you have to take all the equipment out. You know, and, and taking a diesel generator from down here to upstairs is a laborious process, but it's what needs to be done. Let me uh, go in here and real quick make sure the lights are on. Definitely different. It's a big order. Okay, from a construction standpoint, pretty much all the caps are the same. Uh, the other uh, Minot and Grant, uh, F.E. Warren, a little bit bigger inside. But it's still the same uh, blast door. This is an eight ton blast door. Uh, it's, it's balanced, it only takes 60 pounds of pressure to move it, we don't let people move it anymore because once 8 tons starts to move, it doesn't stop very quickly. Okay, so we almost got, became a spot back there. Uh, the artwork you see on there, this is original. Okay, uh, if you remember in World War II, they used to paint on the side of airplanes like Betty Grable, uh, Enola Gay, Felix the Cat. That, they call it nose art. Okay, we still do that at Ellsworth. Um, the missile guys wanted to do something similar. So each door, the other 14 doors, had different types of artwork. This is the most famous one. Uh, and there's a lot of truth to it, too. Worldwide delivery, 30 minutes or less. Because if we launch a missile from here in the continent of the United States, in less than 30 minutes, we had its target. Okay. And yes, the next one is free. <laughs> uh, when they first painted it, we were kind of concerned because of the copyright thing. So we actually sent this picture to Domino's Pizza, and they sent us a nice letter back saying, keep it, and they sent us a 200 free pizza coupons. <laughs> uh, we're gonna go inside the capsule, a couple things. You're, like I said, you're free to take pictures. When you walk in, uh, make sure you watch where you're stepping, because there's tripping hazards in there. Don't stand up right away unless you're sure there's nothing overhead. Everything's built very solid in there, okay? Uh, please don't touch any of the switches or anything. You're not gonna launch anything. <laughs> um, the one just broken switches and please don't sit on the furniture okay and again please ask questions so we're going to go in partially uh, we're going to stop and show you a couple things and we'll continue excuse me continue on go ahead Paul oh yeah the Domino's Pizza local. oh <laughs> thank you yeah if you get on get on both sides here you better watch out here. honey you better duck <laughs> Kidding. What's the uh, no loans, loans over there? Anytime in the Air Force you're working, or even the Navy, you're working around nuclear weapons uh, or is, has access to uh, nuclear weapons, it must be a man by a minimum of two people qualified to task. That way we can monitor each other. So this is why we call it a capsule in a vernacular term, because it's, it's like a big pill on the inside, right? In our case, fil uh, filtered air comes from up above, and the air is cooled and sent down this yellow hose into the racks. Uh, it comes into what we call a clean room, which filters out nuclear, chemical, and biological. So if you threw like tear gas, nerve gas above, it gets filtered out before it gets down. That's if you can get close enough. The air comes in and goes out through what we call blast valves. These valves uh, will slam shut if there's an overpressure. In other words, there's a, uh, an explosion above that sends it and it closes. That way, the pressure stays stable down here and you don't wind up popping your guns. This box is where the crew works. Just the same thing at the other missile wings. This box is hanging from the ceiling on four air shocks. Two here and two more up front. They can move up, this whole box can move up to 18 to 24 inches in any direction. Okay, so if there's a nuclear blast or an earthquake, instead of shaking everything to pieces, the crew can do their job. Um. Did this site also have the emergency dig out hole, hole that goes to the surface? Yes. Because I didn't see it when I was. Yeah, it's on it. the other side. It's on the other side. Come on in. <laughs> so, basically, what happens is uh, somebody, when we were topside looking for the red button, you said punching a button. No, that's not how we do it. Okay, basically what happens is um, in a, I'll give you the quick version. 
what happens is the crew will receive a message. And the message, when they receive it, they'll start decoding. Okay? They'll hear this warbling sound. And let me see if this is actually... What happens is the crew will get a warbling sound, and that warbling sound tells them that an important message is coming across, and they need to get ready to copy that message. Uh, let's see if I can find it. That's what they'll hear. And after, when they hear that, they're going to stop whatever they're doing and go to respective seats. Okay. And then they're going to go ahead and go through their checklist. And step by step, uh, get ready to do the launch procedures. Now, one of the things that it's required them to do is to actually go in to this box here. Again, when you said something about two-man policy or no-loan zone, that's why I have two locks and not one person can get access to it. Okay. So what happens is, is that after the crew decodes the message, and if it's, a proper, if it's a proper message, both the commander and the deputy will both get up and they'll open their locks. Every crew has their own personal lock, because you don't want to get in the situation of what's the combo. So the deputy and the crew commander will unlock the, uh, take their locks off this box. Inside that box, there's a code book and two keys. Okay? That's the commander's key, that's the deputy's key. They'll go back to the respective stations. The deputy will put their key in over here. The commander will be sitting over here and put their key in over there. The commander then will basically say, on my command, key turn three, two, one, turn. They both have to turn their keys within three seconds of each other. Hold, message transmit light, message transmit light goes off. Okay. And what happens now is, is that um, all ten of Delta's missiles has one launch boom. Now there's a timer running in each missile. It's waiting for the second launch boom. Because of the interconnectivity of the launch control centers, remember you have Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Echo in the squad. They're getting the same message. Let me go back and talk about that message. When that message comes out, it does not come just to one location. It goes through the entire ballistic missile force across the United States and even the submarine force. Okay. It tells who, what, when, and how many. So what happens is, is that, let's just say Alpha decoded and at the proper time to launch, Alpha then will go ahead and turn their keys and supply the second boom. Now the Minuteman missiles in Delta's flight has two valid launch boats. Okay, now we get a launching process. Some missiles will leave immediately, some could be up to four hours later. And people ask, why four hours later? Okay, just focus on Ellsworth Air Force Base. We had, we had 150 missiles. Just imagine what would happen if all 150 <laughs> missiles went across the North Pole. Because that's where we're going to go. We're not going to go like the airlines do. We're going over the, we're taking a shortcut. We're going over the top. All right? And if you had 150 missiles going over the top at the same time, they're going to be banging into each other. <laughs> not only that, when the first weapon detonates on the other side of the globe, you don't want another weapon too close behind it that the shockwave from the first one knocks that one off course. So I always compare uh, war is almost like an orchestra. You have a conductor and a sheet of music, <clears throat> and that's what all of us operate off of is that sheet of music. The conductor is actually off at Air Force Base. They developed the entire target plan. We call it the PSYOP, Single, Integra Single Integrated Operation Plan, so everybody knows what's got to happen, where it's going to happen, and when the, that missile's going to be gone. Over here, if you come up here, do a couple things here. Um, we're going to go ahead and do, let's see, right arrow. We'll do the primary axis. This is something that, that what I was mentioning earlier. Uh, let's see, right arrow. <coughs> okay. And then you'll hear That would be coming out of these speakers here. Message 
Okay, so that launch key is inserted. Basically, there's this panel here, another panel over there. Okay. Um, launch sequence, let's see, launch one. We'll just launch one. This is what will happen. Enable code is sent out. Okay. Missile away is, is a hardwired loop. Okay, the only time you can get that is, well, there's actually a couple ways. We used to tease the crews. Um, is the actual missile pulling out of the blowing out of the hole okay then you're going to get that missile away a lot of times we're required to do maintenance in the silo so what we're going to wind up doing is we'll tell the launch we're normally you're supposed to coordinate with the launch crew that you're going to disconnect a particular cable okay and sometimes we forget to tell them that so we go ahead and pull that cable off and so they see that missile away light come on and they you know they're, they're calling us right away like hey we got a miss uncoordinated status here uh, so basically, we'll just tell them, hey, we're just going to, we just pulled the cable off, got to tell you, no biggie, you know. And then sometimes we'll tease them and says, yeah, 2,000 feet and burning good, so. <laughs> <laughs> would, uh, would, the, would the guys feel the missile going off here? Oh, no. They would know. No, they the would silos know. are about, silos are about, uh, minimum is three miles to, to here. Anything between three to four miles. The basic architecture, the easiest way to explain is imagine a wagon wheel, okay? The launch control center is the hub. The under, underground cables going out are the spokes, okay, and the missiles silos that surround that launch control center are the rim, okay. But it's not a perfectly round circle because depending on land conditions and everything else, terrain, that's how we position. But a minimum is three miles. And there's no video, so it's just that light. Just that, that light. Mean, like well, you don't really want a video. I mean, if you want a video, they can probably do videos now because what happens is, uh, starting in 2008, 2009, they start putting uh, cameras out on the launch uh, facilities to assist security folks. Because in the old days, <laughs> the security team goes out there to investigate an outer zone or inner zone alarm. They don't know what's waiting for them out there. And with the camera, at least they have a heads up. And then also in severe weather, that we, because of the silos where they're located at, in severe weather, instead of putting the team in jeopardy, sending them out there to investigate a false alarm, if they don't see anything on the screen, okay, they're going to still check it, but they're going to wait till the weather is a little more stable, you know, to, to send the team out there instead of, you know, putting somebody at risk. Any other questions? So on the two-man crew, mm -hmm. what was the length of duty? Um, the current, currently what the crews are doing are what they call 24-hour, 24-hour mm -hmm. alerts. Uh, so what happens is now in the Air Force, the maximum amount of time working around nuclear weapons is 16 hours. Okay, so you say, wait a minute, if you're only going to allow 24 hours and you're, you're breaking the 16, well, what happens is, is this. Because of some software modifications, we're able to go ahead and close this. You can see all the scratch marks here. We used to put seals, special glass seals here. If you look on that blue cap there, you'll see a sample of the seal there. Okay, mm -hmm. And that small little launch panel with a key goes into is also a safety seal. So when the crew comes down here, um, after they do the initial uh, changeover, inspections and whatever, one crew member is up and another crew member is in rest status. He, they can either lay in the bed or sit in a chair or whatever, but it's just, the, the rules are if you're on rest status, you're not doing anything, okay? Now obviously if something happens, they're gonna wake up and do what, or whatever they have to do to get the job done. So after 12 hours, they switch. And then after 24 hours, a whole new crew from the base comes out to replace them, so it's on a continual rotation. Now with the COVID happening, 
to, you know, because they didn't know what the status is with people. I mean, if you're healthy, what they were going to do is they sent crews out instead of coming back the same day, they actually sent four or five crews out to the launch control center to stay out there because they're healthy. And so the other crews would be stay up top side and one crew down here would be doing their 24 hours and after 24 hours, another crew from upstairs come down here. But now uh, I think things went back to normal. So they're rotating back to the base like, they, like we used to do. But is there, is there also a link of like, I'm only gonna do this for six months or this is my job now forever? Oh, or, it's never forever. Or, uh, I mean, but basically what happens is, is that if you come on crew, you're gonna spend at least three to four years on crew, okay? Now that doesn't mean you're always gonna do the same thing. What happens is, is that in that three or four years, maybe you're you know, really doing a good job, they'll make you an instructor, mm -hmm. okay? So you can instruct new crews. Okay, but that's still a three to four year job. After four years, normally the officers, you know, you start for career broadening, they start moving on to other things, okay. But this, uh, you know, basically you get a second lieutenant uh, just out of college, you send them to Vandenberg for training for six months, and then if they qualify, then they come out, they send them to the respective wings and they get, you know, uh, system qualified. Anything else? How many? There's a lot of electronics here, a lot of sophisticated. How many people just maintain the electronics? Uh, I was one of them. Um, basically, uh, we have what we call an EMT shop, not emergency medical technician, but electromechanical teams. Mm -hmm. We take care of about 75% of all the electronics in a, in a launch control center and silo. The same people who do the launch codes? No, the launch codes are totally different, folks. The codes vault people, the launch codes are actually in this box right here. They're in this mechanical code unit. The codes vault, codes division actually create, generates the codes and, and puts them in here. Okay. So nobody knows what the codes are. Everybody has different jobs and that way not one person knows everything. Um, like I said, my job was to take care of everything that's launch essential, basically from uh, where the console is by the, by the double locks all the way over to here. That was my responsibility. <laughs> and the electronic equipment that's underneath the floor too. Uh, the training was pretty extensive. Uh, basically they took uh, two and a half years of electronics and they crammed it into 12 weeks. So I had a class of 30 people. At the end of 12 weeks only 10 out of the original class made it through. And then that was just the electronics. Now we have the systems portion, the actual missile portion. Um, uh, this portion right here. Uh, that was 20 weeks long, so the 10 of us went into there, only 6 of us graduated, and 6 of us were sent here to begin our Air Force career. And I always tell people, this is still, even today, this job is still the only job in the Air Force where you take a person, their average age is about 23 years old, they have a top secret clearance, uh, they're certified to work on and around nuclear weapons, unsupervised. Mm. Okay. Uh, just as an example, when I was 22 years old, I was a team chief, I was out at the silo. I mean, this just, just my, myself, my partner, and the security guard. There's nobody else there. We're doing everything that we're required to do to make sure that missile stays on alert, uh, target change, uh, electronic tests, whatever. Um, so, you know, this is one of those strange jobs in the Air Force where you better be self-reliant, uh, you better follow the rules because bad things can happen. Now, you said there's two people down here at one time and that's the reason for two separate keys? Yes. And so what if one overcomes the other one and got the key? He has enough time to go to the other station? Good that? question. What mm -hmm. happens is that's the reason why everything is separate. Uh -huh. One person can't reach over and turn both keys. Because you said there's three seconds from one time to another and it's right. not enough time to get over to Right. As I wondered what happened. And not only that, you need another launch control center too to do oh. the same thing. Oh. Oh. So it oh. takes a minimum of four people to do a launch. Oh, okay. I missed that part. So if something went awry here, the other places could yes. depend on each other. To yes. Yes. So I don't know if you ever remember the movie War Games in the very opening scene where they had a uh, they had the launch control center and they got an order to launch. Okay. And the commander basically said, I don't think it's a valid order. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go ahead and turn my keys. I'm not going to do it. Well, the deputy said, if you don't turn your key, I'm going to shoot you. Well, if you shoot, you can't launch. 
<laughs> but it looks good in the movies. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> also in War Games, they copied from us because in November 9th, 1979, we had uh, uh, an incident where we almost launched. Um, what happened was at NORAD in Cheyenne Mountain, they had a, the early warning system detected missile launches from the Soviet Union. And what had happened was is that somebody had taken the training tape and put it into the real monitoring side. So we thought we were under attack on November 9th, 1979. Oh, <laughs> God. So fortunately, the U.S. policy, it still is today, uh, we don't launch on warning. We launch when something actually blows up here. Okay. That's why we spend all that money designing to make sure we have survivability deep underground as far as missile and launch crews. And that's why we have the triad, bombers, land-based ICBMs, and submarine launched. So you can't take all three of those systems out, okay? Um, bombers, back in the old days, bombers was great because you could launch your bombers, you could call them back, okay? Basically, saber rattling, okay? Uh, land-based ICBMs and submarine launch missiles, you know, those are the things that once they're launched, once you release them, they're going to their target. They're gonna finish whatever it's gonna be done. Okay. Submarines are normally last anyway. Land-based ICBMs will usually go first because one, accuracy is a little bit better. Uh, two, uh, if a submarine launches its missile, it gives away its position. Okay. So basically, the, the scenario would be, you would, if your land-based ICBMs are launched, if the other side doesn't capitulate or wants to continue on, then we probably use the submarines and release those. Uh, just to give you an idea, when I talk about MERV, Multiple Independent Reentry Vehicle, Minuteman 3, uh, which is the newest system which is currently out there today, used to be uh, what we would call a MERV. Okay? Excuse me, just mm -hmm. slip by here. Minuteman 3, which is this one here, these two are the scaled by side by side. <laughs> This is what we used to have here, Minuteman 2. This is what's currently in the field today. So if you were going in, if you were able to go in there silently, this is what you would see. Okay, under the hood, when this first came out back in 1976, it was a MERV. It had three reentry vehicles under the hood. Okay. Each one of these reentry vehicles was equivalent to 470 kilotons of explosive. Just to give you a, a, a comparison, the bombs we dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki they were only equivalent to 18 to 20 kilotons. This is 470 kilotons a piece. Okay. Well, again, because of start and because of treaties, we said, okay, fine. We're going to go ahead and make what we call SRV, single reentry vehicle. So all Minuteman 3s today are like this. Okay. So each one has a 700 and, uh, 470 kiloton warhead. Now, to prove a point, uh, earlier in the year we, te we did a test launch out at Vandenberg again but we put three back on and basically it was to let the world know we can put three back on if you want <laughs> but today I guess that you're saying of course we can yes. and then uh, about the question about the uh, yeah okay about the question about one person trying to launch so let me show you this picture this launch control center style does not exist anymore because of upgrades all right so the new console is this right here basically that rack and all of these racks here are no longer in the capsule it's just just one big console that sits right here okay the bed's been moved over to that area now in the old days like we didn't want one person to have the ability to turn both keys well, like I said, we did software changes, so even if both people or one person is able to turn the keys, you still need another launch control center. Well, if you, see, if you look here, you notice that there's four hands, okay? Each person sitting in front of their console, they have to hold a switch oh. to turn the key, yeah, okay? So one person cannot do everything in one capsule. Mm -hmm. Again, <laughs> we have this ability here, plus we have another launch control center doing the same thing, again, providing the second launch vote. The reason why we went to this type of system here because it gave, it gave both people 
uh, better situational awareness. In the old days, the commander was the only one staring at the lights over there. The deputy did, was doing his or her thing over here. By doing it this way, both can see what each other is doing and back each other up as far as the day-to-day -day operation is concerned. But it, it still takes two people to launch. How many boats are required to launch? Uh, two boats. Just two? Two separate launch control centers. And going back to what I said earlier, there is no self-destruct. When that missile leaves the hull, it's going to its target. Okay. Um, you know, it's unlike what you see in the movies and everything. Somebody, Bruce Willis or Arnold Schwarzenegger, saves the day or whatever. It, it's not going to happen. The Patriot missiles can't hit down something like that. Don't know. Probably no. not. Really? Because just remember, when a reentry vehicle comes back in, it's coming in at fifteen thousand miles an hour. Okay, a bullet travels only about two thousand miles an hour. So. You know, that's why I said, from my personal opinion, you're never going to intercept one. That's why I said to get a 96% kill rate, you're gonna mm. it's going to take at least eight anti-ballistic missiles to take it out. Mm. And the United States only has 40. <laughs> yeah, so the in the Minoka Pyramid scenario, they actually would just detonate an explosion near the incoming ballistic missiles and hope that they would destroy them while they were coming over. It wasn't an actual impact. Right. It was an explosion near the missile <laughs> at a certain altitude and they would hope they could decommission them as they were coming in because right. they couldn't directly hit them. Right. That was their dream. Now, the current uh, system that the Army manages, those are actual direct impact. They actually have, because of Reagan's Star Wars thing, they actually have units that will fly out in direct path and control itself to basically put it in the impact path of the incoming warhead. But again, going back to there's so many warheads and only so many anti-ballistic missiles. You know, I mean, just to give you an idea, okay, just just I, just our one of our submarines. One of our Trident uh, Ohio-class submarines carries 24 missiles. Each missile carries eight warheads. That's 192 warheads in one submarine. And how much is the yield of one of those? About 470. Really? Yeah. So. Because basically the, the warhead that we're using on Minuteman 3s is the same one they're using on the submarines. So, so if a 470-ton Kiloton. Kiloton <laughs> lands in uh, Chicago. What's left? Well, Chicago is pretty much gone. Uh, so, what kind of gr ground zero is probably uh, for a 470 kiloton device, an air burst, which does the most damage, you're talking 15 mile radius. I mean, he's gone, vaporized. <laughs> okay, anything after that, now you're talking shockwave damage. Okay, structural damage. Okay, uh, burns pretty much up to maybe 20, 25 miles out. <laughs> because, you know, you're talking like bringing the sun down to the earth. A small sun. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? Anything else? So what, how does the spider web of this work when they, when the president actually says we're going to launch, does it, it goes to another facility that sends the votes out or tries to get the votes for the missiles so like if we were if this site was gonna get a command for the vote where would that come from then the whole process starts you, you know you, you start off right with was the president of the united states basically the president of the united states notifies the pentagon the nmcc national military command authority okay our center and what they do is they generate what they call an EAM, an emergency action message. That emergency action message, what you heard over the speaker, the kilo, whiskey, bravo, and everything, that is the actual message that tells the crews, this is what you're getting ready to do, okay? As far as the launch votes themselves, once the crew decodes the message and they say it's a valid, authenticated message, all they're gonna do is depending on what capsule they're at, 
at a certain time because in that message is going to tell them the actual launch time. And they're going to go ahead and put their keys in and at the, at the launch time they're going to turn their keys. Then the other launch control center who's also decoded that same message has knows what time their launch time is. They're going to turn their keys. That supplies the boats. Now the missiles are on their own, ready to go whenever, they, whenever they're going to go. Okay. All this happens, believe it or not, in less than 10 minutes. That's pretty timely. Yes. So how, how many launch facilities were in one tier here for one wing well, of missile? Well, when we were fully operational, we had 150 silos and 15 launch control centers. And 15, okay. Right. So it's very redundant still, oh, yeah. even here, because this was the first wing, right? Or no, this second wing. The second, oh. Right, second wing. Because Malmstrom up in Montana was the first wing. Oh, that was the first one, okay. Yeah. Actually, they, their, their uh, call to fame was during the Cuban Missile Crisis. They put up 10 missiles ready to go. Mm -hmm. and that's why Kennedy called it his ace in the hole. Okay, because we had Atlas's liquid fuel, we had 10 Minutemans that were put on alert, and actually there was two or three put on alert in Vandenberg in California also, that if we had to go to war, they would have used them. We don't know if they would have worked, but <laughs> at the time, because these were brand new, you know, all the bugs weren't worked out just yet, but they were confident enough they would work. And when you talked about decoding that message, does that like the Bravo whiskey and all that, whatever they have to decode. Does that change daily or something? The Each the, time that message comes out, it's something different. But I mean, like... Um, How do you decode it? Yeah, like, oh, we're talk about yeah. that other stuff. Yeah, in the changes. books, in, in, their, in the classified books, obviously they're not here. Uh, each day... Yeah, that's what I was asking. That yeah. page would have the code for that day. Okay. That's okay. I think maybe like FedEx showed up every day with new codes. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, 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 have the, they have the codes. Our codes vault is the, the folks that actually generate the codes because back in the day, that's how the codes were delivered, not by FedEx, but there was actually a guy or gal that had a briefcase handcuffed to them and they carried the codes. Mm -hmm. Now the codes, the actual launch codes, the codes that are in the box here, that are in this book, okay, Nobody's ever seen them. No human eye has ever seen them. Okay, they're all machine generated and then they're sealed by the National Security Agency, the NSA folks. Okay, no such agency. <laughs> um, and what happens is, is that we call them cookies. And that's why in this, in this book here, there are pages, there are pages in here that contain the codes. Okay, and depending on the message, they will go to the appropriate page, pull that code out and break it. That's why I call it a cookie. It will break it and inside is like a fortune cookie, the code information set. So is this setup duplicated on the submarine? Are there no. two guys like this on the submarine? Uh, on the submarine there are several people. The captain has the keys, the weapons officer has the keys. Uh, I think there's a total of six keys and they're all different locations and stuff they have to be in to put those keys in. So, oh I'm sure no. they finish. Uh, a good example, if you ever have the opportunity to watch uh, Crimson Tide, that's very accurate, uh, showing an actual uh, launch, an actual EAM message coming in. I mean, it's a movie, but it's very accurate. So really, in reality, in the submarine, instead of having multiple launch facilities to get the vault, they have... M they have a more elaborate system that everyone has to vote in the submarine to get the vote to launch. Exactly. And, and so it's all happening in one place instead right. of in multiple sites. Right. And that's why I say if you watch the movie, you'll see how one person can mess it all up <laughs> because he didn't want to put that key in. Okay. Uh, and then also in the submarine, they have a trigger. There's two triggers. There's a training trigger and there's a, uh, a real trigger. And so when they do exercises, it's, it's always a training trigger, okay? Because you don't have the code to get, they actually have to unlock, it's like a little vault, you have to unlock, dial it out to pull the real trigger out. Hmm. So did you guys love the movie, um, it's an ancient movie, Failsafe? Actually, I loved it. I actually I love uh, Doctor Strange Love too. <laughs> but, but in Failsafe, you know, it was just a transistor on a, like a printer that broke, right? Yeah. 
and this, so like what's the what? that actually happened i mean <laughs> a, a solid state circuit failed in 1983 at norad <laughs> and so we had a similar incident i mean not we didn't go to war but we you know things went wrong as far as the screens and everything were shown so it did it does happen <laughs> that's why we have safeguards built in to make sure that we don't really go to war it, it might be classified but can the president just wake up and say i want to start a nuclear war <laughs> mm. I mean, there must be that something. And I, um, somebody not know, really. Mr. President, we're not going yeah. to I don't. I don't. I, I don't think the president. I, I don't know. You know. I mean, I don't think we've ever had an instance where that happens. But it also to be known too, because it's a nuclear weapon. They say, in theory, if the president wanted to release a nuclear weapon on a day, on a peaceful day, let's say, that he or she still needs to work with the Secretary of Defense, two people. Just like I said in the Air Force, two-person two policy. Everything is done in twos with nuclear weapons. But if we're under attack, obviously mm. the president you know, is not going to be able to get with the with Secretary mm. of Defense. That's why he or she has the person following behind with a football, mm -hmm. the big briefcase. Mm. It's got the launch codes in it. Okay. And uh, so the, wherever the president goes, there's that officer, the military officer mm. following behind with a big briefcase. And it's got communication equipment, and it's got the launch codes. Hmm. <laughs> so, we need to head upstairs. Okay. Oh yeah, this is the. Thank you. This is the. Ah, it's up you there. Yeah, I see it on this one. That's the escape hatch. Which you have to dig your way through. Right. Well, a lot of sand and then earth from there. Right. You open it up, and sand is in the culvert. Sand will come out, and then once the sand is all out, you'll go up and to the very end of it there's like a wood fence a wood uh, block there and then uh, there's a shovel in there and then the last six feet you have to dig straight up <laughs> yeah the dream is all the sand is supposed to run down below this capsule yeah. is the dream well the dream is probably we always kind of kid with the crew is that after a nuclear war it'd all be a big block of glass <laughs> so you have a skylight you're not digging your way out <laughs> how long could they stay down here in higher states of readiness they'll bring extra supplies down they can be down here for days yeah. and normally if in a, in a real tactical war uh if they do the launch and everything they the they, they probably won't come out for maybe five to six days mm -hmm. wait for the radiation mm -hmm. and die down you notice the difference too that the one in North Dakota, it's like the beds over there, and there's like another whole aisle on the other side yeah, in they're there. Bigger capsules. Yeah, they're definitely bigger. I don't think I've seen that in the one in uh, North Dakota site either. Uh, they use a different means of communication. That's for Air Force satellite communication, and they're using something else. I forgot what it was. <laughs> so the mechanical room is not underground here. Nope, it's upstairs. Oh, so this one is, in some ways, well, they had the batteries that were down here, yeah, so they could. The floor. Yeah, so even after they lose the mechanical room, they still have that. Oh yeah, they'll have that's the emergency backup. Probably. But in the other capsules, the uh, the mechanical room was hardened, so they were a little bit more redundant, even more right. so. Yeah, because they had their diesel generators and everything else underground. Well, I'm really glad I got to see this because it is different. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's like they kind of like built one side of the North Dakota one smaller and they just didn't put the other, the other capsule on the other side for the mechanical room. Right. Back then, they weren't really concerned about hardness. They were more concerned about getting the silos operational. And then as the other silos came on board, they figured, well, you know, we need to make sure we have the survival, uh, build in the survivability of the entire system. So if, if we were still operational, they probably would have, you know, begun around 1980 or so. They would have started digging in the ground, putting extensions onto this one. But you know, they figure, well, you know, with the new systems coming out, there's no reason to. And plus, with the treaties coming out, you know, don't want to put too much money into it. 
Now the new missile that's coming out, Minuteman is going to be going away, and the new missile is going to be called Sentinel. They're going to be going into the old Minuteman silos, but they're going to be obviously modified to hold the new missile. Hmm. I hate this part. This, I think they like sold off all these silos. Nope. No? Uh, okay, now we can raise that hand up. Okay. Good. Now Minuteman, because of the treaty, they couldn't sell anything off. They had to destroy it. Okay. The missiles that, the silos that you normally see in the, we'll just stay in here for a little bit. Uh, the silos you normally see for sale are the old style liquid fuel uh, Atlas and Titan sites because they were much bigger. Mm. Minuteman, they weren't big. Plus, again, like I said, the treaty said you could, we couldn't keep them. So just to have the Launch Control Center was not a treaty item. But the Minuteman down the road at Delta 9, that was a treaty item. So if you go out to Delta 9, one of the things I always tell people is if you go I'll look on the back side of the, the silo on the door, you'll see a window uh, on, on the bottom of the door. And the reason is, is that it's to not let people just see the wheel, but it's to let the Russians see the wheel to make sure we haven't tried moving the door around and trying to reactivate the site. I mean, we're not going to do that. but. Do these treaties matter anymore if these states don't exist? Uh, well, Russia still exists, you know, and, and, and we still exist. So, yeah, the treaties do matter. Now, what happens is, is that the big argument lately is, is that back when the treaties were first pushed out, it was the United States and the Soviet Union, or Russia. Well, you know, now you got China. Now you got North Korea. You got uh, Iran trying to get a nuclear weapon. Uh, you've got uh, Pakistan. You've got India. We always felt when I was in that the next war would probably start between Pakistan and India. I mean, because they had a death wish with each other. Okay. But governments, you know, change and people are going to say, you know, given time, we probably will bring new treaties out with these other countries. Okay. Or try to prevent them from getting nuclear weapons. Okay. One of the things I always try to finish up with is I know we talked a little doom and gloom as far as the missiles are concerned, but because of those missiles, we were able to get to space a lot quicker. Because in every case, these are military missiles. Uh, this is an Army Redstone, took the bomb off of that, put a, mer a Mercury capsule on top, sent up Alan Shepard, first US astronaut. <laughs> Atlas, it's an ICBM, took the bomb off of that, put a Mercury capsule on top, sent up John Glenn. First at U.S. astronaut to orbit. Titan, that's a monster. Took the bomb off of that, put the Gemini capsule on there. Sent up uh, Gus Grissom and Ed White. The only rocket specifically built for manned space flight at the time was a Saturn V to go to the moon. Everything else, they hitched a ride on an ICBM. Wow. <laughs> you know, and the old saying is, when you absolutely positively need to get it there on time. <laughs> that's the old FedEx commercial, but that's, that's important for us too. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> it's, it's warm. Oh, and then there was sun. <laughs> I'm melting. <laughs> so the, I just want to make sure I understand this right because I'm a very big communications nut. Okay. So the antennas that were that came out over there were they VHF or UHF? HF. They were HF. Right. Receive they were, only. They were receive only. Yep. And then they had the ultra low frequency. That buried in the ground. Buried so in the ground. Yep. How long can how far can ultra low frequency go? Oh man. <laughs> Around the world. Around the world. That's how we used to talk to the subs. It still do. Really? Yep. So what age did you begin your career? Eighteen. Wow. Wow. Awesome. Awesome. Yep. Figured out. Got to do something. So. <laughs> so your expertise is in electrical area. Yeah. Yeah.
taking a little look inside. Boy, I tell you what, it's pretty dang warm in there. So I don't remember what he said this access cover is. It'll be in the tour later and he explains it. I thought he said something about this was the ultra low frequency antenna. But then over here, we'll walk over here. Just keep walking. Sorry about the camera shaking, I'm just holding a hand camera here. There's like, I think four or three antennas that pop out of the ground that are receive only over here and there's like an access cover around that pole right there if you look right there I'll zoom over there I don't know how good this will turn out but there's like several covers there with uh, multiple uh, antennas that can pop up one at a time by command for receive only. I'll try to hold my camera in the air here and see if I can get a shot. A little better one, I'm just guessing. I have no idea if I'm getting it. And then uh, over here, is the, uh, when I zoom over there, is the ultra high frequency antenna that can uh, receive launch um, that is for receive to launch missiles by air like Air Force One or I'm not sure what all the ways are but that there antenna is for aircraft which I believe could possibly be from Air Force One or other um, Air Force I'm not sure I'm just babbling so I'm sure somebody out there knows that's watching this video right now how it all works but that there is supposed to be the ultra high frequency antenna So, yep, this is the Delta One facility. It looks like it's a little bit downsized. 
by the other facility we visited in North Dakota. It's kind of like uh, they didn't take as much time to build this one. So that's all I have.